Um, so um, today I'm going to talk to you uh, a little bit about um, basically reading a machine's mind. So um, this idea of looking at how we understand about the functions of a system or how we understand about its competence and its abilities as, commu as a communicative partner. And so fundamentally, that's what myself and the group that I uh, lead at University College Dublin uh, on speech interaction are really interested in. This idea of how we model, how we understand what a system can do uh, and uh, how we uh, make those assumptions and perceptions, but also how they impact our language choices. So how do they impact how we interact with these systems? And so that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about today. So the methods we use are quantitative and qualitative in the same way. So, uh, so I will be talking a little bit about some quantitative work we've done, but we found that to really get to the heart of the matter, to really get a foundation for this, um, for this problem, we need to go to understand people's views and perceptions in a little bit more detail before we start doing some more quantitative work there too. So I'm going to mix uh, the methods that I'm going to talk about today. So again, a little bit about me, so um, for a, a bit more information for the introduction. Um, so I'm the co-director of the HCI at UCD group, where we have about 25, 20 to 25 students uh, and postdocs and academic faculty working on HCI issues. Uh, the group is split in two, so there's uh, one side is looking at um, uh, mental health uh, technologies and mental health interventions, and the other looks at speech uh, interaction, uh, and we do collaborative projects um, across those areas, as well as looking at particular issues within those domains. Uh, and I direct the speech interaction lab, so the, uh, so the lab that works on um, uh, speech interfaces and speech interaction. Uh, I also uh, am an SFI funded investigator on the ADAPT project where I, uh, I'm involved in uh, some, of the, um, uh, some of the speech interface work that's there. First thing I want to say is that the, uh, the work that I'm going to present today uh, is, uh, is only possible from a major team effort. And so I want to highlight and really thank um, everybody um, from the lab who have contributed to, this piece, uh, to these pieces of work. And so we have the work that I'm going to be presenting to you today and talking about uh, comes from uh, Lee Clark and Diego Garialdi and Justin Edwards, as well as Phil Doyle. But also some of the thought processes behind the, uh, the issues I'm bringing up uh, have uh, come from our new recruits recently, which are Anna Bleakley and Dan Ruff. Um, and we're all looking at the issues of speech interface and speech interaction from a human computer interaction perspective. So rather than focusing on technological developments or the development of systems, what we're really doing is we're trying to figuring out what the user concerns and user issues may be, as well as user perceptions. Now, it almost feels like I don't need to say this uh, anymore, uh, but that these types of devices have proliferated um, uh, across um, into households on our phones uh, and almost wherever we see or whenever I speak to people who want to build an interface now they kind of want to add speech to everything uh, and so speech has, has come from effectively uh, a modality that was really out of fashion in the HCI domain to being probably one of the most fashionable um, uh, modalities to use in your system um, and so this is partly because of the success of Amazon Echo, uh, which has obviously been emulated in smart speakers through Google Home uh, Assistant uh, and uh, through the Apple HomePod, um, as well as through uh, using these uh, intelligent personal assistants on our phones, on our devices. Uh, and so at the moment, we're really at a point of uh, this technology becoming incredibly popular with, uh, with users. That said, though, we know very, comparatively little about the interaction problems and issues and how to design for these systems. And we know comparatively little theoretically as well about why people behave the way they do whenever they interact with these pieces of technology. And one of the things that um, is interesting for me about these types of technologies is that actually the functionality of them is generally kind of invisible. Uh, there's a sense of when you're speaking to these systems, we use the metaphor of human communication and human dialogue, um, which, is, uh, which also allows you to, uh, which, which allows you to scaffold this interaction. But compared to other kind of, uh, uh, of interactions, for instance, with a mobile phone, then, the, um, then uh, there's very little uh, visual scaffolding of what's going on with these types of interfaces. Now, that may be different with robotics or different with uh, devices that have more multimodal capabilities, but with these types of systems, uh, generally the, um, the, uh, the functionality, the way that you form your model, might be relying on other types of priors or other types of uh, 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 communi uh, communicative devices that we, that we kind of use. And this is where human communication comes in. So 
uh, in human communication, we have a sense that we actually kind of try to mind read the, um, the other person that we're interacting with. We make a model or we make some sort of assumptions about what the person understands, what they might know, uh, and uh, what can, uh, uh, therefore what can we can say to them and how we should say it. So we make these assumptions relatively naturally and easily. And a lot of the research in psycholinguistics highlights that this kind of partner modeling, this model of what the person knows and understands, and this, this kind of assumptions that we make, are actually greasing the wheels of dialogue. They make dialogue efficient and effective uh, whenever, we're, whenever we're interacting with, uh, with other people. But again, this kind of thing is done uh, relatively uh, sort of invisibly. It's, it's done by um, your, your um, dialogue partner, um, reading kind of particular perceptions or particular cues in the interaction, but also bringing stereotypical views whenever they first encounter a particular person. Same thing again, this model tends to then develop as you interact with a person. So uh, Susan Brennan talks about this as global and local uh, adaptation. So this idea where we have a global model, a global sense of what a sister, what a person might know and understand, and then that changes uh, to a, um, that might be adapted locally, so that might be adapted to the speaker that you're talking to. And um, there's a real debate in psycholinguistics at the moment of how much we use these models. Is, are we using these models to change the way we speak to people to, that, we're, that we're talking to? In that case, that, that's, that's termed audience design, where we design our, uh, our utterances to, those, uh, to the people that we're speaking to. Or do we only use them whenever breakdown occurs? So do we only use them whenever there's misunderstanding? And so then we alter and adapt our speech based on that. There's a real theoretical debate about how much we use these kind of models. But these models are definitely produced in human dialogue. Now, as I said before, this is, this is if we think about this idea of models when we interact with systems, we kind of know a lot about mental model work around with uh, screen-based devices. We know that people form these models and that they use kind of cues from uh, the system cues from visual, visual cues from interfaces to build uh, a sense or a predictive sense of how to interact with these systems. Now, that might not be the case with these. With these. Again, we may be using some cues that we see in terms of the like, difference of the ring with, uh, with, with, uh, with Amazon, uh, Amazon Echo. Um, but actually, what we might be doing here is we might be using some priors uh, or we might be using some form of, uh, of structure that we have from human conversation uh, to do this. And so this is where um, the first piece of work uh, that I'll be talking uh, about comes from. Now, again, as I said before, these types of systems seem to be uh, uh, popping up everywhere. So this question of how we build these models about what the system can and can't do are incredibly important to the interaction because they're becoming far more common in a number of places, including, as we've looked at in the, uh, as we're looking at in the summer school, uh, healthcare contexts. So if we're going to put speech into uh, healthcare devices uh, and, and use it as a healthcare intervention, we kind of need to know uh, what people, uh, uh, how people form these models and how that might be impacting what they say to the system. Because effectively, in my view, and in the view of, uh, of what we're finding in some of the research, this may be one of the most fundamental things that we need to look at whenever looking at, uh, looking at speech interaction. So what our research team tends to do uh, uh, whenever researching problems around speech interfaces is looking at communication literature to see if there are any theoretical foundations that we can apply to uh, help us design uh, these systems or help us understand why people behave in particular ways. In particularly from my background in psychology, I tend to use a lot of psycholinguistics. So, um, so I, I did a lot of psycholinguistics work uh, in, my, uh, in my undergrad, in my PhD, um, as well as uh, as a research uh, research assistant, uh, working in a lab, looking at um, intelligent, um, uh, looking at uh, IVR systems um, for banking, uh, and we would look at communica communication literature and psycholinguistics literature to find out how to design uh, menus or how to design particular um, uh, particular things in the interaction. So I have a real obsession with psycholinguistics work and a real obsession with the theoretical underpinnings of communication and dialogue, and so this is where a lot of the work in the in the lab uh, uh, comes out. Now, uh, recently our lab completed a review that's just been published in Interacting with Computers around, it's called The State of Speech in, hum in, in HCI, looking at uh, speech work from, um, uh, just uh, all speech work in HCI, to figure out what the themes and challenges are in, to the field at the moment. And one of the things when it comes to 
uh, this idea of behaviour, this idea of interaction, is that there seems to be this assumption that human machine dialogue, as it's termed in most of the papers around the 80s and 90s, where this was a, fa where this was a, a topic that was being looked at, is assumed to be uh, um, driven or uh, impacted by this model. This assu the assumptions that we have of the system being a competent dialogue partner. And so that's why, uh, th uh, theoretically, we see these changes in, uh, in how people interact with the system. That's why we see people using keywords uh, rather than using, uh, than using natural, uh, natural sentences. We also see them using less anaphora than, uh, than in human-human dialogue. And again, this goes back to Amalberti et al. in 1993, where we have uh, all the way through from papers from Bell, Bell and Gustafsson, Brennan in 1998, and, uh, the, uh, and also summarizing this in, uh, in Clark this year. And so these types of models, this assumption that the system is a poor dialogue partner, so we have to adapt to it, uh, it seems to be the reason why we're changing, uh, changing our speech. Uh, and uh, what's happening in this is that there may be relatively superficial cues that are impacting that. Most of the time in these papers, it's a category difference. It's this human versus computer. But what about the design of the system? Is the design of the system impacting something here? Can the design of the system be signaling um, qualities uh, that we may want uh, systems to, uh, uh, to have so we can influence language behavior. So it seems to impact our interaction behavior, but actually generally there's a very little understanding about how these models are built and what are the most important things in these models. And so that's what we've been doing over the past six, seven years is looking at this, uh, looking at this type of question. So firstly, we're looking at this, well, first, uh, the first kind of study that we, that, we, that we ran looking at this kind of work was that, well, firstly, what might drive uh, these, uh, these models uh, in speech interface interaction? So what might be one of the foundational points that we can kind of base our model from? It's not the only one, but it's one that we, uh, but what might be something that drives our initial models in the first place? So this global model, this idea that we have uh, a set of assumptions about what the system can and can't do and, and understand initially uh, before we actually interact with it. Now, the, th the thing I want to highlight to you is that whenever we come to this interaction, we come with baggage. So we come with a number of priors from human communication and human, and human interaction. And that fundamentally is the metaphor we're using in this interaction. So, of course, because we don't have any visual cues to tell us otherwise, there's a sense that we actually come with particular priors from that interaction, particular assumptions about that interaction. They may not be met by the function of the system, but initially people may come with those assumptions. And so what we did is we did a piece of work to look at um, this effect that was looked at initially in 1992 by Fussell and Krauss about the idea of the assumption of the distribution of knowledge. And this is one of the um, uh, points about how people uh, form their partner models in human dialogue. We have a sense that of what people know, uh, and that is generally guided by, by, by what we know ourselves, so what we know and understand. So we generally, uh, there's an effect that we see that we generally overestimate or underestimate what people might know and understand based on our abilities and our, and our knowledge. And so we wanted to see whether that prior kind of applies in uh, what assumption we have about the knowledge, and this is kind of knowledge about, uh, about particular objects. Um, uh, that speech interfaces may have. So what we did is we replicated Fussell and Krauss's uh, research, but instead of just looking at uh, uh, people's uh, perceptions of what other, uh, other people might know, we asked people to judge what they think uh, um, systems might know. And so the study generally goes like this. Um, and this is, again, uh, uh, almost a direct replication of, uh, of Fussell and Krauss's 92 study, where we asked participants to name a set of landmarks that we had, so a set of UK landmarks um, that varied in, in, a, in, a, in, in their, um, in their uh, familiarity. So all the way from Big Ben, for instance, all the way down to Iron Bridge, uh, uh, which not many people uh, managed to name. So we asked them to name those. We then asked them to judge uh, for each of those landmarks, whether they thought, uh, uh, how likely they thought a human would, uh, would know that, another person would know that, uh, and how likely they would think an, uh, an artificial system would know that. And so this is again, so using a, a scale from one to seven for each of those items. So this is again, pretty much a direct replication of the, um, of the Fussell and Krauss study. And what we found here was that we had, uh, as uh, was found in the original study, we found that there was this uh, this almost egocentric um, uh, bias towards people's assumptions of knowledge with humans. 
So there's a sense that if you named the items uh, accurately, you would also assess that other people were more likely to know them. Now, interestingly, this effect happens in exactly the same way for artificial systems. Now, for us, this makes very little sense because we, we thought that potentially people would be coming to these kind of um, uh, these uh, ideas, these interactions, with a sense of going, well, a system would probably know everything. It would be able to kind of pull from, uh, pull from a pool of knowledge that's not there for, these, um, uh, for, for other people. And so there seems to be this kind of prior that we're using. We're again using this kind of shortcut about social distribution of knowledge uh, that seems to be relating to uh, our assessment of whether an artificial partner may know these items as well. And this was corroborated, again, by the correlation between human partner and artificial, uh, artificial partner uh, ratings. So we seem to have this element of bringing a sense of social distribution of knowledge to this interaction as a prior. And that's not necessarily surprising if you think about if we're bringing priors from human uh, interaction to these types of systems. So from this, we kind of thought, well, OK, we've got this, this, uh, this kind of smoking gun, this kind of view of, right, right OK, where there seems to be some sort of similar effect that we're having uh, from human dialogue to human-machine dialogue. What else might be uh, something that's driving uh, our, our models of a, uh, of a system? And there's something that's pretty obvious, and it's a big kind of question in the field. And it's also the, the elephant in the room most of the time whenever talking about uh, spoken dialogue systems. Um, but we wanted to find, and so I'll be revealing that later. Um, uh, so uh, we wanted to find out what else might be impacting this partner model. And for doing this, because there's very little about what people, how people build these models or how people understand the systems more appropriately, we did some qualitative work uh, that was published in Mobile HCI um, in 2017 to look at how people, uh, particularly looking at infrequent users, so how uh, people uh, understood uh, the interaction and what was the most important aspects of the interaction for them and how they were forming their views about what the system can and can't do. Uh, so we uh, ran uh, 20 people through uh, focus groups uh, and uh, who were recruited from the UCD campus. And initially what we did is we asked them to conduct a number of tasks that you would typically see uh, whenever, um, uh, whenever people are interacting with intelligent personal assistants. In this case, we used Siri um, because it was one of the uh, most popular intelligent personal assistants. That's probably changed now, actually. It's probably not the most popular uh, that's used at the moment. Um, but we asked people to conduct these tasks before they arrived. So finding out the weather, um, sending a text to your contact, uh, searching for a recipe, these types of ideas. And then we asked them to discuss uh, their views of the, uh, of the system, how they found the tasks in terms of the interaction, uh, and what they were kind of viewing in terms of uh, how, the system was, uh, how the system was operating. Now, for our, um, for our purposes, we found a number of themes that came out of this work. And, uh, so when we conducted thematic analysis on the, uh, on the output uh, of, the, uh, of the focus groups, we found a number of issues that you that you uh, that you would expect. So, social embarrassment being used in, uh, of these systems being used in public spaces, trust and privacy issues uh, that you that you may see and that have, that have become a bit more of a of a theme. Um, issues with actually the, whether they're truly hands free or not, um, especially in terms of the uh, the view of Siri. But the most important for our idea of what part, uh, what, how people might be building these mental models of the system are these two points in bold here. This idea of speech recognition performance, so it's the typical uh, issue that people have, even though speech recognition is actually pretty good now. Um, so this is one of the things that most people had a lot of problems with. But this you could see as being a problem if, um, uh, if uh, the, uh, the functionality of the system doesn't match your expectations. So, um, so Phil Doyle is actually conducting his PhD looking at how speech recognition performance uh, impacts, uh, impacts these models. But importantly here, and this is the elephant in the room most of the time whenever designing these systems, is the human-like nature of intelligent personal assistants. So we assume that human-like is, is a good metaphor for this interaction. And through the talk, I'm going to try and unwrap whether maybe that's a good or a bad idea. Um, so it's clear, it was clear from this work that there's a human-like nature of IPAs seem to be using, used to scaffold this model. So it is supporting the idea that we should bring these priors from human communication into this interaction. Imagine the only, the only signal you get rather than visuals is the audio from the system, or the synthesis from the system that sounds human-like to make the judgments and assessments about how you're going to interact with that system. So, this humanness seems to be incredibly influential 
in this model. The problem is, though, the only the way that we tend to discuss this is, well, humanness is more natural, therefore natural is better. There actually may be a lot of dimensions to humanness. There may be a lot of things that we can design in that are human-like. There may be a lot of things that, uh, that influence how people think about the systems um, uh, based on human likeness. So we need to find out what the dimensions of this are if we're going to uh, design for it or not uh, in a particular way. So we've done some work recently, which was published in Mobile HCI this year, that looks at trying to break down this human likeness concept into distinct dimensions to try and figure out what are the major, uh, the major dimensions that people might be looking at whenever thinking about human likeness. And this, uh, from this, uh, this work uses a technique from personal construct theory, which basically turns all researchers into naive scientists and asks people to try and compare what are called th uh, three elements uh, um, that they interact with and to try and give dichotomous dimensions uh, to uh, allow us to assess and understand how people view these, uh, these uh, types of entities or these types of elements. And this is the fundamental, the, the, the repertory grid technique is the, is the technique that's used for this kind of, uh, this kind of scientific inquiry. Uh, and what we ask people to do uh, with this is that we ask them to interact with three things, three interlocutors in this, uh, in this way, um, and with two of them being similar and one of them being distinct. Uh, and then we ask people to rate or to, to write uh, uh, single words or single concepts that uh, match how they were thinking or how they're thinking about the interaction with these, uh, with these particular uh, elements. And so, for, um, uh, so most of the time, whenever you, you do repertory grid, you, uh, uh, you don't necessarily have to do a familiarization session. But um, in this case here, we wanted to make sure that people were familiar with the systems uh, and the, uh, the interlocutors that we were, um, that we were um, asking them to compare. So we asked them to um, do nine predefined tasks with each of these partners uh, when they came to the lab. And so obviously, one of them being a human and the other two being uh, different types of inter intelligent personal assistants. So one of them being Amazon, uh, the Amazon Echo and the other one being Siri, uh, being Siri. Now these were chosen because the Amazon Echo has some elements of feedback but is mostly voice-based, uh, sorry, multimodal feedback but is voice-based apart from the ring at the top. The uh, Siri actually uh, produces a lot of visual feedback as well. So there seems to be a number of uh, 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 differences, uh, a number of differences there, but only very slight. Of course, the major difference between these partners that you can speak to is that obviously one of them is a human. And so one of them uh, uh, could be seen as incredibly flexible and much, uh, 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 much better communicated than the other, the other two. And so this is again because the idea, if the humanness is the metaphor, if humanness is the view, then we have to try and figure out what the dimensions of this humanness actually are. So we got 24 uh, native or near-native English speakers to participate in the study who were randomly uh, recruited from UCD and we asked them to conduct nine uh, predetermined questions or use nine predetermined questions when interacting with these systems. And this was with, um, with every single element, with every single partner, uh, they were asked to do these, uh, to do these things. So, and we categorized these uh, questions in, in, in three categories. And they were designed specifically so that some would be better for the human to, 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 to be able to do, and some would be better for the system to do. So an example here would be the conversational. So how are you today? Where are you from? Tell me a joke. The system can do that. But a human can do that, do that too, but it might give you a bit more detail in terms of those things rather than these canned responses from these, uh, from these interfaces. Information retrieval, so um, the systems might be, uh, system might be very, very good at that, whereas the human may be quite poor at, at that, so remembering what the square root of a large number is, for instance, or remembering how to get from the city centre to the city centre. Um, and then the, we included a set of opinion-based um, questions. So, for instance, asking what you think of a uh, particular uh, famous person's name uh, or, or, a, or a particular uh, genre of music. These opinion-based um, uh, uh, opinion content is, well, what we found was that it's basically it's quite hard, but users don't really find it very believable when systems produce this kind of thing. But however, uh, a human's very good at giving a lot of detail and giving a lot of reasoning behind those. And so when we, when we, when we, when we conducted this, we got people to ask these questions. Again, they're in a, they're in a, um, a, a within the batches, they're in randomized orders when we, uh, when we did this. We also then asked them after these experiences to uh, list 
um, a, set of, uh, a set of items in a column. So we asked them to say, write a list of words that best describes the differences and similarities between these dialogue partners in terms of their communicative ability. So list the concepts that come to mind uh, that when you think about the key similarities and differences that, um, that, are, with these, uh, that are with these systems. So you have one column of implicit, what are called implicit constructs. And then when you finish that column, you ask people to then reflect on those and give you an antonym or give you some, it doesn't have to be an antonym, but some opposite to that. Now, not only is this really good for trying to figure out the dimensions of how people are viewing these systems from a humanist perspective, it's also very good for developing a questionnaire if you're trying to develop a humanist or a partner model-based questionnaire, which is what Phil's doing in his PhD just, just now. So um, we then did a rating phase where we asked people to take these, uh, these, uh, these polar, polar um, uh, opposites uh, and place each of the partners on these, conti uh, on these continuums. And this is so uh, we could get a sense of which concept was more related to the human than it was to the system and how people viewed these uh, in, uh, in, uh, in different ways. And so this would be an example of what you would see. So you'd have a grid that was produced by the participants. So they'd have written these words uh, on each side. And then we'd ask them to place a red, blue, or green line, depending on the, um, uh, depending on the, um, uh, the systems that they're interacting with. And this is kind of standard for the, for, for, um, uh, for, uh, for, for repertory grid uh, kind of studies. So what we found from the, from the results, we found a lot about the experience of the system, so how people experience these types of um, devices. Um, but we also, I'm going to go into the dimensions of, of humanists in a second, which is probably more relevant for what I'm uh, talking about here. But we did find that there are key differences, obviously, to these types of systems. So people thought that uh, the system was, would be more fact-based and, and, and bookish knowledge, whereas uh, a human has more experiential uh, and contextualized knowledge, but it's also more biased. Uh, can also be more biased in the way that they are, uh, the, the knowledge they produce. Whether that's right or wrong is a, 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 a debate. Obviously, we can have biased um, algorithms in, um, uh, in uh, producing, uh, producing such results as well. Um, and also, this idea of imbuing a system with these opinions, with views of uh, uh, emotional views on, on, particular, on particular things in society, was generally seen with a bit of distrust. There was a sense of that these systems may not necessarily be um, be uh, um, uh, be uh, genuine whenever producing these, uh, and it was seen as fake and kind of false whenever they did so, uh, especially in terms of empathy and interpersonal connection. And that might be due to the fact that people, you know, so people aren't stupid. They know that this is a system. And they know that that's a human. So that they're kind of like, well, a system shouldn't be able to generate that from my own stereotypical view, the own model that I have. Therefore, I see that as a bit fake and a bit false. So um, there's also there's, there's many, much more detail about the experiential side in the paper as well. So I've got the reference to the paper at the end of the, at the, end of the study, uh, which is uh, up on archive just now. So importantly for us, we found this kind of dimensionality. And again, this table is in the paper here as well. I just want to pull out a number of dimensions that we saw here. So in terms of the human likeness or the humanness of the system, we see that actually when we mention humanness, there may be a number of things that might be driving that. So for instance, vocal qualities might be something that, that, that are driving that. So it may be synthesis that may be producing something or some sort of aspects of, uh, of perceptions that we have there. Uh, the interactivity of the, of, the, of the partner. So whether there's uh, a sense of them being able to be, um, uh, so whether it was seen as two-way interaction or one-way. So whether it was seen as just getting information in and out or whether it was seen as more of a, what we generally see is more dialogue oriented or more, or more conversation oriented. We also might have things like linguistic content. So if we use uh, sort of um, that the system might be seen as more detailed and more formal, whereas hu uh, uh, humans might be seen as using more vague uh, or uh, slang based uh, languages to, uh, language to use that kind of thing. So the language and linguistic content that a system is using is going to be impacting that perception of humanness too. And this idea of partner knowledge set, which comes down to the first experiment I was discussing, this idea of the perception of the type of knowledge or the level of knowledge that a system might have, that also has dimensions for humanists as well. So we can see from this that there are different dimensions that we need to consider when we say human-like, when we say humanness. What do we mean? Do we mean we're trying to imbue the sense of that, uh, that, um, uh, that the, uh, the system has more human-like knowledge or not? Uh, are we using vocal qualities to do that? Uh, or are we trying to use interpersonal connection to do that kind of thing? One of the key things I want to highlight as well, that people, as I said before, people aren't stupid. They know they're interacting with a system or a human. 
the partner identity and role was also a significant uh, uh, set here. So whether there's a human or a machine. So again, there's this binary difference uh, that comes from just the entity uh, that you're interacting with. So as we see this idea, so, we want to, so after this we wanted to kind of explore this idea of vocal qualities as well and how that might be impacting uh, how people form these kind of models. So we've seen that there are a number of dimensions to humanness, a number of dimensions to this human, uh, this human scaff the, the scaffold of, uh, of, uh, of, of partner models that we have that use this kind of human likeness. And so what kind of, uh, so the synthesis might be very important in that regard. And so how does this scaffold uh, the system and what does it lead to and how can we manipulate this kind of thing with the, uh, with the, with the voice? Can we kind of uh, let people uh, to see that a system might be more uh, capable, uh, a much better um, dialogue partner? Uh, can we even change the words that we're going to say to the system based on using these kind of, uh, these kind of vocal cues? So it's clear that actually that there's some elements of it with synthesis, we might be able to actually impact these kind of partner models. And that comes back to the idea of uh, psycholinguistics work, suggesting that actually these models are generally impacted by relatively superficial cues. So uh, Nickerson in 1999 talks about the dimensions that would be needed and required for uh, or that impact these types of models uh, and how we over and underestimate. Uh, particular aspects of partner quality and ability based on these. But one of the key uh, considerations may be, for instance, the accent that a system uses. So if, the, uh, if a system uses a particular, um, uh, a particular uh, nationality uh, of accent, then we may assume that it has particular lexical knowledge or particular lexical specialties um, that need to be taken into consideration. Uh, also, if it's more human or less human, we might assume that the system might be better or worse. Uh, in terms of uh, in terms of communicative competence, and Brannigan uh, et al. in, in uh, 2011 kind of did this in a in a in a broad kind of sense. They uh, ran a study where they asked people to uh, conduct uh, a dialogue game with a system, but told uh, some people one of the systems was really bad through a review, and one of the was really basic, and one of the systems was really advanced through a review. And just those cues of the reviews impacted the types of words they used in interaction and impacted the, the linguistic effect that they saw. And so it's clear that we still use these relatively superficial cues in this kind of interaction. So what we tried to do was to try, try to have a look at uh, this idea of synthesis and where uh, and what aspects of synthesis might be important in terms of, in terms of doing that. So um, we ran a, um, a, a study asking people to, um, asking people to, uh, to judge uh, the, it's pretty much a listening test. So asking people to judge eight clips of synthesis from a particular uh, uh, dialogue partner that they were going to interact with in a future experiment. Um, and um, we had recordings that had either max anthropomorphism or max humanness, which was basically just me recorded. So I'm not going to play you the recordings of me, but it's like, it's the square, because uh, that's the game that we were looking at. So we were looking at using these kind of, these kind of statements in the game. So we wanted them to be related to the game. So, and then we also had a very robotic voice condition. Which was heard so again, this kind of, um, uh, this kind of idea of uh, uh, sort of not, not natural in its, in its sense at all. And then we had an anthropomorphic, uh, which sounds a lot more natural in terms, of, uh, in terms of the way it's produced. And so we wanted to see, well, how do people rate these? So if they're listening to these, uh, listening to these systems, and this is before they've even, st even spoken to a system, before they've even uttered a system. So it's your initial partner model. So how are they going to rate these types of systems? And so we asked them to rate on a, 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 rate on a number of dimensions. And the, the work's published in the International Journal of Human Computer Studies. And I've got the reference again at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the, the work. But we firstly looked at the idea of whether people saw the systems uh, as basic or advanced to try and map onto what Brannigan et al. see as a major judgment that people are making, so in terms of a basic or advanced system. And we see that the voice does have some effect here. We see that the robotic voice is seen as, uh, as more basic than the, uh, than the other two conditions, so in the human and the anthropomorphic conditions. Note in all of these that the human and anthropomorphic conditions, there's no statistically significant difference. So there seems to be this sense that the robotic uh, condition is actually having the, uh, uh, the most impact on this kind, of, uh, this, this kind of voice. And the uh, anthropomorphic synthesis seems to be uh, working similar to human-like 
uh, voices. Same thing again with this uh, rating of inflexible or flexible. So whether the system was flexible or inflexible, um, uh, uh, if they were asked to judge, a, uh, judge it as a dialogue partner. And same thing as incompetent and competence. The robotic voice seems to have a statistically significantly reduced uh, rating for incompetence, uh, uh, for, uh, for incompetence and competence than the human and anthropomorphic conditions. So this, would ac this actually supports some of the literature that's, that's from, uh, from robotics and from, uh, from some other literature on anthropomorphism that suggests that people rate these types of systems that use uh, more anthropomorphic voices as more intelligent uh, whenever interacting with these systems. So the voice does seem to have some element or some impact on these kind of perceptions that people may form or may impact or may use to form or impact their, uh, their speech. And so that's the next question. So the next question here was, can actually, can synthesis, can the choices that we make about the humanness impact the kind of speech that people generate? impact the kind of words in particular that people use. So I'm kind of fascinated with lexical choice uh, and why people make particular decisions to use particular words. Um, and so, uh, so this is what we focused on. We focused on the idea, can we use vocal qualities? Can we use this, uh, this design uh, uh, kind of tweak that we have to change people's language, or to change people's language choices? And if so, this gives us an idea that this might actually be impacting how we form our utterances in interaction. And so it may be a key thing to consider when we're designing systems uh, and based, based on the fact that it might be impacting language choice. So an example here would be the, um, so this is, uh, in Ireland I'd call this coriander, right? Okay, so if I was speaking to President Michael D. Higgins, our great president, uh, in, in, in Ireland, I would say, Michael, uh, and I'm shopping with him, I'd say, Michael, pass me the coriander, right? So I've, uh, uh, I've uh, made a choice to say coriander because he's, he's Irish and he's likely to know that. If I was speaking to Bernie Sanders, um, then I might want to say cilantro, right? Because that's what, the, uh, what it would be called in the US. So I'm making a distinct choice to choose that word based on the fact that I have made an assumption that Bernie is more likely to know American English and uh, Michael D is more likely to know Hiberno English. And so the experiment we set up is based on this premise, but with systems. So it's looking at, right, if a system is interacting with you with an American accent versus a, an Irish accent, are you going to be more likely to choose American words with the American accented speech system? So, and this would highlight that we have some element of audience design. Not only is a partner model being produced by the voice, it's actually impacting what we're saying. So it actually has some sort of behavioral impact. And this would be important for theory, theory building about how these may impact language choices and dialogue with systems. So the experiment that we ran here, so this is published in the, at the CUI conference this year. Um, and um, so the first stage that we uh, asked people to go through a familiarization session. Uh, so they were given uh, these images uh, and they were given the names uh, that these systems have for American and Irish, uh, Irish terms, and they were asked to memorize them. They were asked to, um, that to, to, uh, to, to try and uh, remember these names because they're going to be asked about them after the experiment. And there's a classic kind of technique that's used in a lot of psychology uh, research uh, whenever trying to imbue people with some knowledge that they may need for the experiment. Um, and so we had 18 pictures with Irish or US English terms, um, and uh, we, we showed the users these. Uh, this was to make sure that, uh, that people uh, had the knowledge that they needed to conduct the experiment. So they knew if they had that signal uh, that they're uh, interacting with a US partner uh, and they felt inclined to use that US term, they knew what, what term to use uh, uh, in that regard. Uh, the second stage of this experiment, after conducting that, they, 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 um, they um, ran through a referential communication task. Now these tasks are typically language games that you see with two images uh, and you're asked to name an image out of the two, uh, uh, out of the array um, and you're asked to name that to your partner so they can select it. Uh, and these are used throughout psycholinguistics literature to try and get at causal, uh, what's causing people to choose particular words. And so we, uh, uh, we used a similar, uh, similar game to that used by Brannigan et al in 2011 where People were displayed with two images, uh, and then there was an, uh, the, an image was highlighted, and they were asked to name that image to their partner. And then after, uh, uh, and but before that, they were also asked to, to their, the partner would name an image to them, 
uh, and they would uh, be asked to select that image. And I'll show you the screens uh, for this in a second. So what people would see, so it's really basic, right? Uh, so, uh, and this is what these games generally look like. And so they're based, the images are based on from a paper in, in, the, in the 1970s that looked at norms for naming these types of items. Um, and so, um, so in the first screen, uh, when you're a participant and you're asked to be the matcher, you would hear a description from your partner. You'd hear a name from your partner being stated for these two images, uh, for one of these two images. And if you hear, for instance, in this case, it's the book, your task as a participant is to select that book, is to click on that, and then the screen moves on. You then turn into the namer. The person who uh, you're meant to be describing the, the, the picture to your partner. So in this case, uh, as a participant, if I hear an Irish accented voice, I might say it's the spanner. Uh, if I hear a US accented voice, I might say it's the wrench. And if we see these differences, it suggests that we're altering our speech based on our partner. So it suggests that we've, uh, we've, uh, we're, we're doing audience design whenever choosing the words that we, that we, that we state. And remember, these are, uh, these, are, these are systems that we're interacting with. And so for the systems, we had Irish accented speech, so which is Sarah Voice Caitlin. It's the so, it's the so it's got that lovely Irish lilt. Um, and we also have the uh, US accented it's speech. The so. It's the so these are so these are the partners that the um, so these are the partners that um, that people heard whenever interacting, and they went through I think it's 90, 93 turns of doing this. So they heard this voice an awful lot as they went through uh, went through the system. We also uh, at the start of the experiment we also told them whether they were interacting with a computer or a human. It was always a computer. Um, but we told half of them they're interacting with a human and half with a the computer. Again, this was what's been done in previous literature around this kind of, uh, this kind of effect. Uh, we found no difference, actually, that, um, between humans and computers in terms of those conditions. Um, and we also told them whether they're interacting with the US or an Irish-based uh, Irish system. And so what we found was that, as we'd expect from audience design, we saw that people did significantly, were significantly more likely to select, or sorry, to use um, US uh, lexical terms whenever they're interacting with the US partner. So it seems like this vocal quality, or it seems like this idea of the nationality of the system that people perceive may be impacting the types of words that people may be using. Now, I want to note something here that even though people were more likely to use US terms, they weren't necessarily the most ubiquitous type of words that we saw. As you can see, that there was still, out, out of the experiment, there's only about 25% of the utterances were US-based, uh, US-based lexical terms that were used. So people are still using Hiberno English terms in both conditions, but they're just more likely to use US terms in a, in a, if a system has a US accent or is, is highlighted as being a US-based uh, US system. And so, that's important for, uh, for, uh, for kind of theorizing about how this model may be impacting our language behavior. It suggests that it may be influencing some choices that we're making in whenever looking at language production in this type, uh, in, uh, in speech-based interaction. So, um, so as I said before, so people are more likely to use US lexical terms when interacting with the US system, and they, um, the, these Hiberno-English terms are still mostly commonly used. Now this has an interesting echo with some of the theoretical work around this area around egocentrism versus uh, non-egocentric speech production, where there are um, uh, some pieces of work that highlight that we only ever change our speech if we really kind of need to, uh, uh, and that we're basically producing stuff that's easier for us to produce whenever we're speaking to people and potentially systems. That's what we're working on at the moment. Um, but in this case here, we've seen that there seems to be some sort of audience design, but it may not be the only effect going on, uh, because we also see that a lot of people that people are also using a lot of Hiberno English terms. So. So, one of the, so, so I've gone through the idea that we bring these uh, sort of conversational priors from human interaction. We also then have this anchor of humanness as this model for a partner uh, uh, in human-machine dialogue. And it's because of the design that we're choosing to do, this human likeness that we're choosing to, to, uh, to make uh, in, uh, in our design of these systems, that's leading us to use these kind of priors. It also leads us to potentially change our language choices uh, whenever, we, uh, whenever we interact. Um, so that's interesting from a theoretical point of view because it means that audience design is occurring in these types of interactions, supporting some of the previous literature, and we have a sense that design might be impacting that. But 
one of the questions that kept on lingering with us was actually, does this humanness actually even make sense? So does it make sense as an interaction scaffold? Um, and does it actually do more harm than good? So um, there's some work in 2016 from Luger and Selen that uh, suggests that actually it, this creates uh, a, a gulf of expectation um, with, the, with the system. So there's a sense that um, the human likeness of a voice might actually assume, uh, imbue human abilities and might uh, influence us in how we interact with the system, uh, but they actually don't match the capabilities of the system. So if you try and have a natural conversation with it, it falls down pretty quickly. So we kind of know that from developing and understanding these types of systems. That, uh, and we see that a little bit from the humanist, uh, the humanist paper, the humanist dimensions, is that people are kind of very um, uh, sort of uh, disparaging about some of these types of human-like techniques that are in these, uh, in these types of systems. So if we are going to this next step, which seems to be the kind of way in the literature that seems to be going from task-oriented to more social talk or social chat conversation, can we do it, first of all? And should we do it? Because there may be some barriers there that, are, that mean that we'll never truly achieve natural conversation with these types of systems. And that might be a psychological barrier. That might be a barrier that these, these systems are, two, are two, distinct, uh, two distinct things. So the conversation that we might have may be slightly uh, different or a different type of conversation that we need to consider. And so this model might not actually be kind of helpful when we're looking at this type of interaction. And so especially if we kind of think about uh, this sort of kind of healthcare context, um, the, uh, this is where um, this kind of chat or social talk may be important, uh, especially if you're thinking about um, uh, long-term care uh, agents. Um, uh, if they're, uh, the argument goes, if they're only task-oriented, then people may not use them very often and they might see them as very impersonal uh, and they may not be giving any extra kind of social care that would be given from uh, from human-like uh, human -like carers. So we're working on a project with uh, Trinity College called the Adele Project that's looking exactly at those kind of issues. And this is where the research from this is coming from. And so the research came from the view of, do we want systems to be like, uh, like what Theodore Twombly experiences in her? Do we want them to be chat-oriented and that we, that we build bonds with them, we build trust, we build, uh, we build friendships with them, we build romantic relationships in the end. I hope I haven't spoiled the ending for anybody. Um, so um, it's a really good film, actually. You should definitely watch it if you haven't. Um, and uh, so uh, do we want to go for this? And if so, uh, what do we need to do? Or do we actually truly probably end up something like this? So um, the similarities are uncanny, aren't they? Um, so do we end up with trying to generate uh, a human, sorry Mark, um, but end up with something like this, a, a facsimile of, uh, of, um, of, of, of a human in all of its, um, you know, and again, this is not sort of kind of like a, a new thought. If you go to robotics, if you look at Maury's Uncanny Valley, this kind of idea uh, uh, goes through, the, through that entirely as well. So we're looking at this kind of idea for conversation in particular. So we had 17 participants uh, that came to the lab and we asked them to uh, reflect on four main topics. And this again comes from qualitative work because there's not huge amounts of quantitative work around this kind of area uh, or a huge amount of, of foundational work around this area to be able to base some of this on. So uh, we asked people to reflect on important characteristics of conversation they have with people. So conversation they have with others. What are the things that they uh, like about conversation, what are the things that they're doing conversation for? And so that kind of had, gave us the idea of, well, this, these are the things we might be trying to, should be trying to imbue um, systems with. We should be thinking about potentially um, um, seeing whether these concepts come from that kind of uh, get through in that, in that element of the systems. And then we asked them about reflecting about attitudes towards agent conversation, particularly asking them to think about com more conversational based interactions. Uh, with systems and what they thought about that, whilst reflecting on the characteristics of conversation. So whilst reflecting on what they mentioned were the, uh, the, um, the characteristics that they found in conversation with other people. Um, and then uh, we also asked them to reflect on appropriate scenarios for agents uh, and actually healthcare and, uh, and home care. Interestingly, not for them, but for the elderly. Uh, was, uh, was, was something that came out and it was like, you know, oh, I wouldn't like to use this, but I'm sure the elderly would. Those are the, those are the comments that we got. Uh, so poor elderly being, uh, being, uh, being these robots being pushed on them. Um, so, um, and so what we found was that 
And this goes through the linguistics literature, the pragmatics literature, sociolinguistics literature throughout. So these findings aren't new for conversation here. Um, but that people um, conducted a number of different types of conversation with, with, with others. So there are social conversations and transactional, uh, more task-based conversations. And there are a number of status effects within those as well. So uh, people uh, had kind of acquaintance-based conversations. They had different conversations with their boss compared to their friends. Uh, they also uh, had uh, different types of aims within those conversations, whether it's to increase kind of mutual uh, increase trustworthiness and bond, uh, or whether it's to get a task completed. Um, there's also an aim with these types of conversations of uh, fostering mutual understanding and common ground. Again, that's not new from the psycholinguistics literature, from the literature on dialogue, that whenever we're interacting with other people, there's a sense of that we're trying to build, a co uh, build common ground, build mutual understanding and build mutual knowledge bases with those, uh, with those types of uh, with those inter uh, interlocutors. We also saw that people highlighted that actually in conversation with other people, they feel that they're an active, uh, they have agency, they, they are an active participant, and they're also a participatory listener. So they're a person that listen, is listening to somebody else communicating and waiting to respond to that type of communication and to what's being said. And so they have an active role, even when they're listening, in this type of conversation. And that humour was incredibly important to try and wrap all of this together. There was a sense of that humour was, was really uh, important for wrapping uh, trustworthiness and bond and increasing that kind of bond and interaction. Now, when we asked them to reflect about these in human-machine conversation, there were some interesting trends that we saw. So one of the things was it was almost entirely transactional. Everybody, instead of, instead of highlighting that that would be good with a system, they were like, well, a system is a transactional entity. It's something that I want to do something with, and I want to do something that they, I want them to do something for me, not necessarily wanting to chat with a system or bond with a system. So it was very, the transactional nature of the interaction was really highly emphasized. And it actually suggests that maybe the metaphor we're looking at, should be looking at, is not necessarily chit chat or not necessarily social talk, but potentially more kind of acquaintance or, uh, or uh, sort of kind of like uh, boss, uh, boss employee relations. Uh, or this kind of thing, or maybe actually some participants mentioned master-servant relationship, uh, where uh, you know you're demanding the system to do things for you, and the system does them rather than chatting, uh, chatting socially with you. And so there's there's less of a sense of a social connection there. There's also this kind of question about whether the system is actually understanding you, or whether it's just recognizing you. So whether it's just recognizing what you're saying or whether it's actually fully understanding the meaning and the layered meanings that you may have with particular statements. And that might be a barrier to bringing this bond or this trust that people have with the, uh, with the systems. People don't necessarily believe that a system would ever be able to really understand what you're saying or understand them in particular. Um, as well as this idea of using personalization rather than developing common ground, rather than it being a mutual process to build common ground that was seen as well you know, the system can use data to personalize to me, but we're not gonna build that together. Uh, in fact, if one of the people say, if I thought, I think one of the quotes was, if I thought I had common ground with the machine, I'd be, I'd be really sad. Um, so there's a sense of trying to, uh, to so this concept may be looked at more as personalization in this interaction than actually build, building mutual trust and mutual common ground. Again, as I said, there was this status effect, this fundamental thing that ran through pretty much all the data was this idea that the machine is the machine is a is a is a is a is a servant to me is something that is going to do stuff for me um, rather than be my buddy or my friend uh, and no matter what level of conversation that's going to be I will still see that status effect being uh, being being there and interestingly instead of building trust between people so as we use conversation to tr to, to trust others uh, and to build that feeling of trust. People just wanted functional trust. They were kind of like, well, actually, th this conversation, uh, the conversational system might be more about trying to recognize me appropriately or trying to get, you know, get, my, um, uh, get my, my object appropriately or get something done for me uh, accurately rather than actually building this kind, of, uh, uh, this kind of emotional view. And so that kind of led us to the idea that, well, human agent conversation is not potentially going to be human-human conversation. It's just not. So we can try and we can kind of see whether there's a sense that there's going to be, uh, if we imbue it with human-like qualities, 
uh, and we try and get the technical aspects of, 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 uh, of kind of faking these human qualities that we see, uh, we might get quite close to the idea of having a conversational system or an operational conversational system that's there. But fundamentally, there may be category, it might be a category difference. It might be a difference to the fact that this human conversation is far more rich in terms of what's there than we can actually uh, produce. And that's partly due to the fact of a psychological um, barrier there that may be that this is a system and this is a human and the human is far more rich in their, in their, in their abilities and experiences than the system has, uh, has been and potentially will be. I'm never saying never because you probably play this video back 10 years time and go, you're completely wrong. Um, so that's fine. Uh, I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, but I, I, I think that fundamentally we might need to think about human agent conversation as really a different type of conversation. Um, so it may be, again, uh, looking at the human dialogue literature, but looking at some uh, literature around status effects and interaction with, uh, so looking at a different, a different uh, metaphor for conversation. It's not a chit chat buddy, which is kind of, uh, which is seen a number of times in these papers when we look at conversational agents uh, um, for, uh, for healthcare in particular. It might be more to do with the fact of a, of a more of a uh, more of a status-based role, and so we might be able to look at different types of uh, different types of metaphors around those types of conversation, but we need uh, we definitely need more work about what this conversation might be able to be, because uh, I don't think myself it will be a facsimile of human-human interaction, and if it is, it may end up being a very poor one. And so we need to consider what that might be, especially in terms of these types of scenarios. So there are definitely, there's definitely a need potentially for this kind of, um, this kind of element of, of, of social talk and social interaction within these aspects here. But what are the barriers and the virtues in particular that we want, uh, so the barriers that we have, but also the virtues that we want these systems to have? What are the qualities that we want these systems to have from a user perspective, not from a technical perspective? What do we want, what does the user actually want in these types of systems? Uh, and we need to really listen to that. We need to listen to understand what these users really need to have in these types of systems. Because they're effectively, some of the things that we're saying about this is that in terms of healthcare, ro uh, healthcare robots or healthcare agents, is these are replacing your, uh, your um, or augmenting your current care or your future care. So we need to understand really what users would kind of feel that they would require and want out of an automated system, not out of a system that they, uh, out of the, the system that they already have. So just to conclude, um, so I think that partner models, this, is this sense of what the system knows and understands and how we view the system and what the system can and cannot do, I think it's probably one of the most fundamentally important issues in speech interface interaction. And it's one that design can, can help. It's one that design can impact on. Um, and it's one that we need to consider in speech interaction. And we bring priors from human dialogue into these types of interactions, whether we design them in or not. Um, but the thing is, what we need to do is we need to make sure that they're, that they're actually appropriate, that those priors are either being used or those priors are actually appropriate to what's, uh, to what's being done. And that's being, uh, uh, that's being talked about by, uh, by people like, um, uh, by people at the University of Sheffield, so Roger Moore, uh, talking about whether we should be making voices human or not, for instance, whether we should actually be using robotic voices with these systems, because it highlights the functionality much better than human-like uh, human synthesis. Uh, so we need to think about how the design is scaffolding this model and scaffolding these perceptions of system competence. And then we need to consider whether what we're doing at the moment in terms of humanness or human likeness or aiming for human chat-based systems is even appropriate in the type of situations that we have. And actually, as interaction designers or HCI researchers, we're perfectly placed to try and find that. We're perfectly placed to try and inform whether those things are appropriate or not. And actually, in, in, in some sense, there may be a ceiling effect to this element of humanness as well. So we take these priors into account, but also, again, as I said before, people aren't stupid. They have this sense that there's a system there that may not necessarily have the same qualities as a human has, and we're aware of those. And we actually have stereotypes about how good or bad a system is in particular ways that may be guiding our expectations of these systems along with these priors. So we need to understand that, that dual nature more appropriately. And at the moment, we don't have that knowledge uh, uh, um, at 
at hand uh, uh, very quickly. But I think there may be a sense that even if we do, do go max humanness or full humanness in terms, of, in terms of chat, in terms of conversational, social talk and dialogue, we might actually hit a ceiling that no matter what we do, there may, uh, the, the, uh, our models may uh, lead us to still see these systems as limited and not necessarily being human-like in the way they behave. So without further ado, I just want to thank all the sponsors for the work and all the people who have supported us over the years for doing this research. And again, a massive thank you to all of the researchers who have been involved in this work uh, throughout. Uh, this work wouldn't have happened without them, and they, they're, they're a, real, a real credit here in terms of the team that's there. And so without th further ado, I'd like to say thanks very much. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Are there already questions? Yes. Uh, I'm going to make a statement rather than mm -hmm. a question. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the uh, presentation. Uh, my understanding at the moment is that the whole having a ceiling of uh, uh, the human uh, understanding of uh, the system being fake. Yeah. Uh, I feel this has much more um, advantage in, in a certain part of the healthcare, for example, uh, in treating depression, mm -hmm. for example. Okay. So in that field, what happens is normally people end up uh, thinking that uh, they are not enough, they are in a rumination loop, thinking about what other people are thinking about them mm -hmm. all the time. And if we can use voice interaction in such case, uh, we can be able to uh, have people, or, or people who are in, in depression or going to depression, help them uh, in a therapeutic uh, way, uh, because these artificial systems, which we have already know that it's an artificial system, this does not judge them yes. in that way. Yes. So what, what do you think about I, I, I think you're exactly right, actually, in terms of there is there's a benefit to people feeling that there is that these systems are systems. Yeah. And I think that, um, so actually, interestingly, for that, there would be a question about whether you need to make the system human-like for that to occur. And I don't think you would. That would be my, that would be my hypothesis, one to probably explore. But there's a sense of, you're completely right whenever someone speaks to those types of systems that they can be more open uh, with those systems with those um, um, uh, whenever discussing those kind of issues. Uh, so there is benefits to that and I think that one of the things I'm kind of stressing here is that exactly your point, it's, there are benefits to the systems being automated, to, to being seen as systems. And so we shouldn't necessarily as a field strive for humanness all the time. And it may be that the humanness gives a signal of uh, as an entry point for people to kind of view what the systems, uh, what, uh, you know, uh, how to interact with the system, but it may not be the, the end goal for everything. And I don't think in, in that case that would be. So yeah, I, I think you're, I think you're bang on. I think you're dead right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a Kai paper <laughs> this year, uh, and actually they found out that if the agent pretends to be depressive, this prevents uh, the person uh, to have another uh, phase of. Uh, it was an interesting study. Yes, yeah, so uh, yeah. you could model the agent to pretend to be depressed. So that was, I think it was Mina Lee's, wasn't it? It was from, yeah, I think it was from, um, yeah, I, I, I saw that in the session as well, and that was kind of interesting because, again, that's a sense of maybe, um, maybe there's a sense of that even though there's, there's a system there, it has to kind of try and highlight that it may be having some understanding. So actually, the humanness aspect there might be the fact that you're highlighting understanding rather than giving it cues on how to interact with the system. Uh, so thank you again for the presentation and this is interesting to know and um, talking about systems should be system and not try to mimic humans. So uh, what if, uh, so in this scenario when we say that system should be system, so if the system does error so they are, the trust level might go down, but yeah. when we say that these are system and system can also do errors, we are more accepting that there must be errors. Yeah. Uh, so this is a statement, but I also want to understand in the healthcare perspective, um, so there was a robot. Uh, so are we giving a voice interaction, a voice assistant a form that it takes a robot or 
how do we now think when a voice assistant or Alexa or any uh, a smart speaker has a form? Will it have a different perception on the patient itself? Uh, why are we giving the form or is there a need to give a form? That is a broader question. Do you mean the like the form as in the physical entity? Yeah. The yeah, physical I, shape. Why? yeah, I mean that's so again that's a really interesting question. I mean it probably be more I'm probably more qualified for a roboticist to answer. Um, but I'm going to give my view anyway. Uh, <laughs> so um, I think actually the form, the form in, in the human likeness perspective, the humanist perspective of the scaffold doesn't help. Um, and you can actually see this uh, in, in a number of robots that have now been designed to be like animals or pets uh, rather than human-like uh, human -like, um, uh, uh, robots. Again, I mean, that goes back to sort of Molly's idea of the uncanny valley, so the sort of like kind of creepiness and eeriness that, that, that creeps in. Um, I mean, I also think that I kind of agree with, um, uh, so Matthew A. Like, talks about this in synthesis, but I think it in more general. It's actually just a, it's a lack of imagination, actually, to, to try and aim for humanness in those situations in that regard. And I don't actually even think that in a healthcare context it has to be necessarily a human-like system. The question I would ask is that why is it? So um, why is it a human-like uh, representation? Uh, and does it need to be um, uh, across so, the things? Mm -hmm. So there, there needs to be study done if it is a pet or someone else from how the patients are going to behave or how it is going to affect the... Completely. I, I completely agree with that. So again, that's the other thing with these types of, uh, with these, uh, types of interactions. I mean, the, because we're at such a... Again, I, I saw this at Kai this year and last year, this kind of, this kind of idea kind of seeping through uh, about this idea of design, designing these systems to be more human-like and being a bit more questioned. You need more studies to figure out what the form should be and what the, the voice should be communicating. Um, because, as I keep on saying to the lab as well, and I keep on saying this, like, we're, do, we've, we're doing the easy bit a bit at the moment, saying that this is kind of wrong. Uh, the answer to the question is, that, well, what's right then? What's right for the situations and scenarios? And that's when the real, where the real challenge is. But you don't get that until you speak to the users or speak to the stakeholders within that situation. That's classic HCI, classic interaction design kind of work. It really needs to be done in this kind of area, and it's been lacking. So there's a lot of work in design going on at the moment to try and do that. So people in Toronto are doing a lot of work about how to design these sorts of systems as well. So, so before the next question, yeah. could you repeat that question because that would improve the recording. Oh, sorry. Yes. So, so, uh, so I was asking, so uh, asking about the um, the idea of the form. So, it, so, so the form of a, of a system, say for instance, a care robot scenario, um, would there would there be any issues? That would that is that is that correct characterization? Okay. One more service. Yeah. <laughs> um, so in the healthcare perspective, and then we want to bring the voice assistant, how far we should build our voice assistant, which mimic nurse or doctor. So at this present moment, I think we want to free up the nurses and the doctors so that they can do much more meaningful work. Yeah. And patient always or might ask repetitive questions. When is my lunch coming? Uh, the TV is not working. Yeah. And for that purpose, we are thinking that voice assistant could come into the picture. But moving forward, we are also thinking how can voice assistant give more information about the treatment? Yeah. So how far we should go where they tell these information or this information should come from in the doctors or nurses? Yeah, so, so, so the question was basically, so, so what's, what role these types of systems should have, especially in terms of whether we're trying to free up time for nurses and doctors to be able to do other tasks? Uh, across that, it's a really interesting question. I mean, it's again, it's something that, w so with the sort of kind of status effects that we were seeing in the in the Kai paper that, that, that we had just there, um, it may be that you that, uh, that the trust level, you may not be able to achieve the trust level by trying to automate a doctor um, uh, in that situation scenario, or, or enough so that the users are, are comfortable with it. Um, so it's a really interesting question, but it's one that I I, I don't know. We have to figure out where the agents can fit in that kind of care in that kind of care chain, um, and I wonder whether that's something that definitely it definitely needs work in terms of how we figure that out. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, first, I have a clarification question. Mm -hmm. You briefly mentioned our mental models, yeah. And when you talk about mental models, is it about understanding how the machine works because that looks like to me as a conceptual model, or the humans uh, model the personality of the voice assistant. Uh, so is it? Yeah, I, I, I think so. 
So, it's, so when we talk about partner models in this case here, it's probably more functional. Uh, it's a sort of uh, the sort of or functional or as you're saying sort of kind of conceptual uh, level. So the idea that uh, what kind of knowledge the system has, how capable they are in terms of interaction, um, personality uh, in terms of you kind of imbuing voice with personality. Although I'm always a bit skeptical about that kind of work in synthesis because um, uh, it's not a clear perceptual. Um, uh, there's no there's no clear perceptual results for it. So for instance, if you try and imbue someone with the extroverted personality, uh, they, come up as, uh, they, they come across as psychopath. Because uh, most of the time we're not extroverted all the time. Uh, personality is a sort of a trait of a, of a span that has different types of behaviours. So, um, so I think that in terms of personality perceptions, uh, that definitely does have an impact on the functional perceptions in, in the models that we have. But I'd say that, that that's what we're looking at here. We're looking at the sense that they might have uh, impact on, uh, on, on functional aspects of what people think the system can do, rather than thinking whether people like the personality or not. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I was thinking about, could it be that the model is Yes. <coughs> so that people learn from movies, from movies like 2001, that like human-like voices are connected to intelligence systems yeah. and vice versa. I, I think that can definitely be driving the stereotypes, yeah. So, I mean, so if we're thinking about kind of you're bringing kind of priors from what you're experiencing beforehand and your, and your experiences from popular culture, that may be, that may be true. Uh, and it may be, and that also may be the reason why we've tried to go down the road of, of, of human likeness, we're kind of following sci-fi's lead, um, rather than deciding whether that's a good or a bad idea. Um, so yeah, I, th I think those priors could probably be giving you some of the some of the some of the impact that's going on here. But also, it's informing the design designers, and it's maybe not the right way to go down. But yeah, I, I, I agree that probably is forming something of it. So and then the second question. Um, so you said that um, a conversation or a chit chat um, bot is not always appropriate for like the healthcare context. So would it help to design um, a conversational agent like with a really professional tone to prevent people from even thinking about the chit chat robot to make it like some really professional and behavior? Yeah, I mean, so 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 it it may do. So we so we kind of suggest that kind of aspect in the paper where it may be. We kind of model kind of um, desk-based conversations, so like, you know, sort of um, kind of more service-oriented conversations, then more uh, more chit-chat and social talk-based conversations in those scenarios. And how you cue those would be a different design set of design decisions than if you're queuing social talk. Um, I I think it depends on what the application or what the application of the voice assistant is. Um, uh, so. At some point, there may be some element. I mean, so because I've also done work on social talk, uh, and I like the idea of doing work on social talk in terms of human human dialogue, and so I'm kind of still attached to the idea that there may be some situations where social talk is appropriate. But the, about, you know, the data that we found <laughs> suggests that might not be the case. But I think that yeah, if if you're if you, you might be um, if your uh, situation needs to model uh, really needs to model more service oriented context. If chat isn't fundamental to it, then why add it? Uh, and if it is truly fundamental, we might find a, a, a human-machine chat kind of way of talking rather than trying to emulate human-human chat and human-human conversation. But what that is, I don't know. <laughs> well, I have another question. Uh, you mentioned that some of the, the participants said, this is for the elderly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as if they have a certain model uh, what elderly people would say to an agent. So is it necessary also to study the effect age has yes. in designing the interface? So if I want to work in healthcare, then maybe uh, it might be particularly important to know, okay, this is an elderly patient, but a young nurse or um, an older nurse. So I probably create a quite different uh, dialogue based on, on knowing the age of the person. I, definitely. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of, and we talk about this in the lab all the time, because there's a lot of kind of, a, uh, a lot of throwaway comments that people make, especially like, even designers of these systems kind of going, well, we design the only, um, but don't necessarily understand the needs and requirements of that, and also how they view the, how they view the technology in particular. Um, so there needs to be huge about 
more work on that. And um, so I think that we need to. Um, that also kind of needs to be caveated in this case. See, we're talking about conversational agents to people who are sort of you know in their twenties and thirties who would be using these kind of you know maybe thinking about the minister of service um, context. Or we did highlight healthcare as one of the contexts for you know a carer if they done something in hospital or something like that and they're caring for them. But yeah, if we're looking at all the users in particular, we need to understand what requirements are for those all the users for that kind of voice system, um, and also what kind of things they're required from in, in, in that regard from that interaction. I think that's probably not done as not done So, as so the participants in your studies were all of the typical 25-year-olds? Uh, 20, uh, 25 to 40-year-olds, oh, so, 40, 40 so these staff and students. So they were say, yeah, yeah, so they crossed that way then. So we, we, so, and that was the interesting thing, that we kind of, we wanted to look at the idea of using, uh, so the adult group is looking at the sort of um, home, care, uh, home care and healthcare context. But there's a sense of that we, um, uh, it was really interesting how quickly people went to all elderly care, so it was that sense of like, I wouldn't want these, or I wouldn't want these to talk to me. But yeah, they could talk to my grand if they wanted to. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, so there's a sense of like, so, I, so we actually took a lot of their views about where these contexts could be covered with a pinch of salt, and actually we mentioned that in the paper. We mentioned the fact that these, that they're not talking about their own experiences. They're talking about, when they're talking about their own experiences, they're talking about conversational agents as, a, as an idea <coughs> for. Uh, for having conversations in terms of those, those um, dimensions they thought were important in conversation. So, yeah, but it was interesting about how quickly they went to that. And I think a lot of designers, a lot of projects go to that as well, without necessarily engaging more with those users. Mm -hmm. so. Yes, please. Um, I will be signing up because I have already signed up. Um, and I um, will be signing up because I have already signed up. Thank you for this very interesting talk. And I have a kind of, I think, provocative question. Okay, I great. So. Great. Um, um, I want to ask you um, if I understood you rightly. You um, you, you you struggle with the uh, human likeness metaphor, right? Mm -hmm. And you were asking if we can get rid of it anyway, or if we should have should get rid of it, right? Um, and I want to ask you if that is even possible, as long as we are using the conversational mode that is solely human, you know. Um, and even when I understood your um, your results, rightly, mm -hmm. the robotic voice, the not non anthropomorphic voice, was less um, mm -hmm. human like um, yeah. perceived, but it still had some kind of human likeness. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Really good question. So, um, yeah, I mean, the. So I think in terms of. Uh, and that's the reason why I think that the, human, the, the humanness kind of categories are really interesting, because it's a sense of that actually, there may be some that are necessary. So, for instance, the, uh, the comp link to the content might be necessary to be as it's unintelligible. So uh, we might need to, to, to have that. Uh, we also might have, in terms of the ability for people to, for it to recognize human speech and human speech input, but does it have to have human vocal-like qualities? Does it have to have kind of, um, uh, do we need to try and hide the category difference? Uh, between the two. And I think that's where we get, a, uh, where we're kind of uh, questioning whether the, some of the other design decisions that you're making to try and simulate or give someone a view that this system is human uh, are appropriate. But you're right, there are definitely some situ there, there are things that are hard coded into the way the modality works that are fundamentally communicative. So it's more human. about not making it too human like. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's 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 about it's about well it's also about thinking about it, right? So I mean, and that's the other thing. I mean, because whenever the thing used to frustrate me when I was going to a, a number of speech chat conferences was that there's there's, there's very and Matthew Ayler highlights this in a few papers, I uh, believe one in speech this year. There's very little thought about it. It's more about well, humanness is natural, so naturalness is the best thing, uh, especially in terms of synthesis. So. You know, there's uh, actually the argument that, uh, that Matthew has is that you know synthesis shouldn't necessarily just produce what people do; it should perform. Um, and so, um, yeah, there's a, there, there, there's a video of that presentation at Cairo, which is quite funny. Um, but um, that we should be looking at this idea of performance, not replication. And this mimicry objective is kind of wrong-headed. I think that's where a lot of the work needs to be needs to be placed. But you're right; fundamentally, the interaction may have human elements to it. So you may need to communicate some elements of that to support the interaction, but I think we're going too far right now. 
I think we're going too far, it actually ends up breaking the interaction, breaking the interaction. So it's about, as HCI research, it's about calibrating that correctly. Um, and then for, for me, like it's, you know, for the stuff that I'm interested in, it's about theoretically what, the, um, what that does to interaction, what that does from a communicative uh, perspective to interaction. Yeah. Can, I, can I have another question? Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you very much. You should know we are in between people and their coffee. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be around all day. So, 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 I, can, yeah. I can ask this question later if you like. No, no. Oh, no. Another okay. question. I have, um, I think, some kind of addition to your mm -hmm. last question. I think you asked, um, you said that, okay, it's not um, social interaction as you think. As, as you thought it, it would be, people don't perceive it as a social interaction, but as some something else. Right? Mm -hmm. And when I when I went through your um, through the results of that, I was thinking about maybe it's it's not that it's not social interaction. It's more like it's not internet social interaction. Yeah. The interpersonal, yeah. the, the pr or a social psychologist says primary interaction. Yeah. And when I saw, thought um, thought about um, the the uh, HMI um, interaction, it's transactional, it's one way understanding, personalization, status eff eff mm -hmm. um, effect, and functional. I was thinking about when I'm talking on the phone to a call center, and there's a person there, yeah. that's exactly what I expect it to be. I don't want it to be mutual, I don't want it to be social, it does not understand my feelings or something like this. So I think it's more like a what socialists call a secondary interaction. Mm -hmm. It's more like an between an employee and an employer. And I think that's basically it. We don't need to look very far beyond that. I would yeah. just pro provoke it. No, that's no, so, so, so that's exactly what we say in the paper as well, actually, is what we say in the, uh, when we talk about this being a different kind of conversation, a different kind of, kind of, um, kind of conversation interaction, that actually we do mention that it should be modeling on more service-based context, so more, maybe more transactional. Uh, types of types of interaction. That's what technically has been done in a number of the intelligent personal assistance stuff that's over there, or the chat box that you think about uh, around in that way. And I completely agree with you. They're maybe not ne so. It's not that they're not social because they involve two entities that are, they're, they're transacting, um, and they there may be some sort of social element to that. But there's uh, but it's to do with the this fundamentally just talk for the sake of talking uh, is going to be a problematic design area. Um, and there may be a functional um, kind of ceiling, that, or there may, sorry, there may be a kind of ceiling that people sort of see that maybe is not necessarily being the most appropriate way to to, to, to go forward. So I agree with you. I, I, I completely agree. But it's when we go to the next, and as as a lot of projects are doing right now, going to the next level of, of moving from transactional to chat plus transaction, and then to solely chat. So, uh, and the question is, with those two at the top that are chat plus transactions, so we chat, uh, are they wise, first of all? And secondly, what, uh, uh, is there actually a kind of barrier that people would, wouldn't see the interaction being appropriate with the system in terms of especially so we chat on? So I think that it's, it's, it's um, I agree with you. Okay, so it's a long one way of saying I agree with you. <laughs> so there was one very last question now. Uh, how can I uh, trust a voice, if I can't be sure uh, there is a person behind because uh, the voice uh, can't be um, differentiated, um, there are no difference between a uh, machine's voice and a real human yeah. voice, and um, I can't be sure there is a person who can be sentenced in case of uh, unmoral behavior and who uh, um, has um, no moral, maybe. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I, I think trust is, I think trust is one of the really major uh, concepts that's probably coming down the, coming down the pike in, um, uh, in this kind of area. Um, I think you're. Uh, I mean, you're right in terms of like how can you, you know, well, well, how can you trust um, a sort of a system with a, If I'm getting what you say correctly, how do I trust a system with a human-like voice when there isn't a human at the other end? Uh, and that might be a different type of trust. So it might be kind of like functional trust. It might be that kind of sense of that um, I'm actually looking at how the system should function appropriately for my needs, rather than actually trusting it 
as a social entity or as a, as, a, as, a, as a person in a conversation, as you do with other, with other people. So um, there's, actually, there's actually a lot of, uh, there's a session at the Conversation User Interfaces Conference um, uh, in Dublin, and particularly at trust and ethics of like, these types of systems. And there's a big debate about what trust actually means in terms of definition. We ran a workshop at the, um, uh, the HAI conference as well on this, and uh, the, it's not clear what we actually really mean by trust in these types of interactions. So uh, whether it's trust that something is executed appropriately, or whether it's trust that the, um, I believe that you won't use my data in a nefarious way, uh, or is it do I, um, do I trust that, you know, uh, do I trust you with information, do I trust you with this, that giving you, uh, giving you banking information or giving you, or giving you secrets uh, about me. Um, and uh, the way it's conceptualized might be very different. But I think that's really a, it's an open question in terms of those kind of aspects of trust. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you.